What's shaking, everybody? Ross Mandel is here, and today we are going public. That's right. We got a treat for all of you today. I'm sitting with Dr. Lena Haji. Hi. What's shaking, Lena? <laughs> Not much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It is up. Everybody out there is witnessing this. This is a special treat. She's a beautiful woman, and she's very learned and educated and has spent 20 plus years as a psychologist where? So I've been a psych I've been a PhD level psychologist for seven or eight years, but I worked in prisons on and off for the last 23 years. Did we hear that right? Prisons. That's right. What? County, state, federal? State. I've worked in nine prisons and two forensic hospitals in four states, Florida, California, New York, and New Jersey. What? I mean, this is why. What a treat for me. Many of you know that uh, this so-called bad boy spent a few years himself in the prison system. During my journey, I experienced uh, three county jails, mm -hmm. a detention center, uh, federal prison, two federal prison camps, halfway house, home confinement, a little probation. I mean, I'm pretty well-rounded. You are pretty well-rounded. <laughs> <laughs> and I had the privilege, while I was incarcerated, to experience some private one-on-ones with uh, various prison psychologists. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that. It's good to know. And even though I shouldn't say this, I'm going to say it, none of them were as pleasing to the eye as Dr. Lena Haji. First of all, Lena, tell us about you. Lena Haji, when I heard that name, I said, it's a very exotic kind of name. Like, what kind of name is that? So Haji is actually a Muslim name. I'm not Muslim. Um, my mother is French from France. My father was Indian from East Africa, Tanzania. I was born in Switzerland and raised in New York. The, that happened because my parents worked for the United Nations. So I've mixed with a lot of things. What a story. <laughs> Your parents worked for the United Nations. They did. In what capacity? So my father was a pretty high-ranking economist. You no, know, you're from I here. like that, yes. Yeah, he was a high-ranking economist, and my mother was a French teacher. That's actually how they met. My mother was teaching my dad French. Naughty mom. She was his teacher. Uh, right, nothing wrong the, with French. <laughs> at the United Nations <laughs> in Switzerland. They got married, and then well, I was supposed to be raised in Switzerland, but my dad got a transfer to the UN in New York, and that's how I ended up being raised in New York. Very cool. Now, when you say Switzerland. Geneva. Geneva. Yes. Okay. I've been accused allegedly being in Switzerland, and I still deny it, <laughs> just for the record. But uh, that's wild. What a wild story. You don't you don't hear that every day. No, it's very cool. I'm I'm I love that I'm pretty international, and that and you know New York is such an international city. I it went is. to an international school. I didn't even know racism existed until I was like 15. Right. You know, crazy, I just thought right? my friends were black, white, Chinese, gay, straight, rich, poor. And I, I melting pot of New York. Exactly. And then uh, as I got older, I was like, oh, not everybody thinks like that. Now, when you say New York, you mean New York's a big place, the city? Or? The city. I grew up uh, on Roosevelt Island in Manhattan. Did you really? Yes, I grew up on Roosevelt what? Island. I used to take that tram. Yeah. Just like when I was a young guy getting high with the boys, we'd say, <laughs> let's go on a tram. Let's, go, let's uh, go to Roosevelt Island. That was my only way to get to school for the first 10, 11 years of my life because they hadn't built a subway you yet. You actually lived on yeah. Roosevelt? Yeah. And you took that? My family's still there. You took that, re really? Because I understand. It's pretty horrible right now. I don't know if that's true. There's like a migrant uh, center there where they're putting all Not these on the illegal island. immigrants. Well, I, I don't think so. Well, the, the rent the rent has gone up significantly. Everywhere. Um, everywhere. Thank God, just, my, my thank God the government control. says there's no inflation because uh, <laughs> otherwise I don't know why you spent $10 on a dozen eggs. So I grew up on Roosevelt Island. Then I lived in the Bronx for seven years. The Bronx? Yes, the Bronx. What are you saying? I married a Bronx girl. Oh, We're in the Bronx. Of course Bronx. you did. I lived, uh, I went to Lehman College for my bachelor's degree. Oh my goodness. So I lived off Mashulu and I lived on uh, Gun Hill Road and East Tremont. Boy, oh boy. I wish my ex was here right now. She'd be pinning you down. <laughs> she grew up on Newbold Avenue. Oh, okay. And uh, real Bronx girl. And my friend I was telling you about earlier, Stevie, mm -hmm. Bronx boy. He yeah. grew up in the projects. 
Bronx, are, Bronx were rough back then. Yeah. I mean, they're still rough. He says it was really rough. It was really and, rough. And uh, really rough growing up, but it made him a better man, you know? I agree. And um, so we got a lot of ground to cover here. From Geneva mm -hmm. to Roosevelt Island. Mm -hmm. And somehow you end up helping incarcerated men and women or just mostly men? Mostly men, but I've also worked with female inmates as well. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, wow. And, and, and I... Lena was referred to me by a beloved friend of mine who also was my criminal attorney. Great guy. Partner with me. His name is Mark Astor. He's awesome. He speaks like the Queen's English, right? He's a uh, yes. you know, little highfalutin. <laughs> but he's a dear friend of mine going back for over 20 years. And uh, I knew his father, I knew his sister, I knew his brother, the whole family. And um, he recommended that uh, I, ha he said, you got to meet this Lena Haji. Sweet. I said, in what capacity? He goes, slow down, cowboy. <laughs> he says, uh, she's got a fascinating story. Oh, thanks. Now, how old were you when you actually left, left Geneva? I was three. So, okay, I'm so you don't really remember Yorker. Geneva. Not right? really. I'm, I'm a New Yorker forever right. and ever. Yeah. And you, 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 I, can, I can testify to the fact that she represents herself in a New York kind of way. Thank you. I take that as a compliment. It is a huge compliment. <laughs> and everywhere I go, they're like, you're from New York, yeah, of right? Of course. I said, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That thank means you very honest. much. Exactly. That means I'm honest. I'm straightforward. To the point. Direct. That's right. You know how I feel right away, right? right? I'm not sugarcoating it. Nothing up my sleeve, literally. Correct. Okay, so now you're growing up, you're on Roosevelt Island, family's still there. I can't even family's believe that there. red tram. I could yeah. see it like, you know. It's still there. We, you know, it's a crazy story. And um, you went to school in the Bronx, in Lehman College. I went to Lehman College. And what happened? How does how does a woman like you uh, get, you know, I know where you got to, but let's hear a little bit about the journey because the journey has got to be crazy, right? Yeah, so when I was nine years old, I was actually diagnosed with a major depression, you know. Um, depression? Yeah, it was kind of crazy. My parents were, were having some issues and uh, no doctor could figure out what was going on what was going on with me, I stopped eating. And, you know, they, they did neurological tests, cardiology, cardiology tests. They took me to every single doctor and nobody could figure out what was going on. They thought I was anorexic because I was a gymnast, blah, blah, blah. My mother finally took me to a psychologist. And if this woman, I was only nine, this woman, wow. she was the first one to ask me questions that none of the other doctors had asked me. Like, I really felt like she was listening to me. Correct. And I left that office and I asked my mother, what kind of doctor is that? And she said, that's a psychologist. And I was like, sold. That's what I want to do what I want to do. This is an unbelievable story because when I went to prison yeah. in 2014, I left behind, I had two daughters. Mm -hmm. One was uh, 14 and my baby was 11. And she ended up going to the University of Florida while I was away. Graduated, by the way, in three years, but I had the privilege this past January because I was done with my sentence and the probation office let me go to her graduation nice. and let me go to a visiting weekend before right. the graduation, went to a ball game and all these different things. And my daughter got a major in psychology. Good for her. And you know why? Why? Because she doesn't want, she wants to help children that might be going through a very similar type experience to help uh, those that are as unfortunate as she was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, to, if she... To go through yeah. that experience. With her dad being away, yeah. Yep, so she, uh, she's, a, she's an incredible young woman. Sydney, what's up, baby? Don't get mad. Telling your story. She needs any guidance. She can bother me anytime. I, I listen. So she uh, got a major in psychology and now decided she wants to be an attorney. Good for her. <laughs> so she can help people that were, you know... Uh, that is suffering. Yeah. The way the way our family suffered in right. an odd way, even though we had a they had a very privileged upbringing. Sure. And um, it's just that that's a testimony to to the kind of person you must be. I appreciate that. Because I believe that there's a there's an innate goodness in people. Yeah. And it was also drilled in my head. You know, my parents, the United Nations is a kumbaya, help the world, save yeah, yeah, save yeah. people kind of organization, even if you don't agree with it, that that's the type of organization it is. So my parents drilled it in my head in a very early age to care about your fellow man, to care about those who are less privileged than you, to care about those who are suffering. And so I think, I, I really thank my parents for that. You know, my parents weren't perfect, but I thank them for instilling that in me because uh, 
you know, I spent my entire life helping people who are kind of forgotten, you know? They're the forgotten population. Not even kind of. They are. They are not only forgotten, but they're tossed away almost. They're tossed away. They're mistreated. Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, I, it, it's a privilege to do what I do, really. I, wow. What a soundbite that is. <laughs> Where's Nelson? <laughs> I'm playing. So, uh, okay, you grow up, you graduate Lehman College. What did you study at Lehman College? Psychology. Okay. I knew already. Yeah. You already knew. So you decided that uh, this psychologist had an effect on your life in, in sort of a Very positive much. way. Very much. Sort of left, left an imprint on your brain. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. You know, I love that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I have to say it to my own st- to my own story, I had an Uncle Oscar. Mm-hmm. Uncle Oscar was, uh, he was about five foot five and he was very fat. And, uh, but he had a really nice watch. And when he went into his pocket, he had a money clip and it was stacked with bills, mm-hmm. hundreds. And he was very generous and he would give all the kids money. The only relative that would do that. And he had a hot wife, my Aunt Rita. Mm-hmm. My Aunt Rita was for Uncle Oscar, a first round draft pick, a 10. Because you don't expect a, a guy to, you know, short, fat guy to, to be get with Rita. this tall, gorgeous, right, this sexy woman, my Aunt Rita. And, um, but he took out that money clip mm-hmm. and I would stare at it. And he wasn't really particularly known for being smart or, or, or clever big business guy, Mm -hmm. but he always had a money clip and he had money and he had his cards in it. Mm -hmm. And all the other men had wallets, Mm -hmm. leather wallets. Mm -hmm. I had like 50 of them growing up. You know, everywhere you go, you got your wallet. It's Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, all these different things. But that that money clip was imprinted on my brain. I was a kid. I was like seven, eight, 10, whatever. And now you have a money clip. And every time Oscar would come, you'd peel off a 20. Not just for me, my brother, the kids, all the, you know, the different, you know, your cousins. Yeah. And I was embedded in my brain. So, you know, there's a worthy woman, doctor, psychologist, a helper. She was, you were, you were affected by the psychologist. Yeah. I was affected by Uncle Alaska's money clip. I'm a little <laughs> shallow. And, uh, and uh, you know, and I have the money clip. I see. And people say to me, they say, so, uh, you know, at various times, your wallet, was your wallet? I said, Carry a wallet. Said, no wallet. No, it's a money clip. Fair it's enough. A Tiffany paper clip, it's called. So let's get let's get down to business now. Okay. You knew you were going to be a psychologist. It's a it's a far cry to help, you know, people. Yes. And then to end up helping inmates. Right. That's like that's quite right. a leap. Right. So let tell us how'd you end up in prison? What kind of prison? How that tell us about that story because it has to be a story there. I understand you grew up in Manhattan, right? You yeah, worked in Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that bartending and yeah. So you know, Manhattan to me is forever awesome. I mean, it's changed a lot, but um, you know, like my friends were 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 from all walks of life. Correct. You know, black, white, gay, straight, old, young, rich, poor, and in New York, you know, you're so smushed. You know this that you you have no choice but to get along with everybody. You're in proximity. Yeah, you're in close proximity, right. and so I feel like I would. You know, plus my parents worked at the United Nations. I went to the United Nations. School. They were working at the United Nations while you were growing up. In- yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So they yeah. transferred from uh- from Geneva to New York. Wow. UN. Yeah. So wow. I was raised with this very you know kumbaya. We are the world. You know, racism doesn't exist. Almost colorblind to a fault. Um, kind of way, and it was it was great. You know, my parents. I, I got to go to private school because the UN paid for it. I got to travel as a kid, um, and so how did I get to inmates? I took a kind of a dumbed down forensic psychology course at Lehman. It was called Psychology and the Law, and uh, this gorgeous woman walks in. She's still a professor there, actually. Gorgeous woman, very confident, tall blonde, just absolutely beautiful. And she comes in and she starts talking about how she works with sex offenders and psychopaths and serial killers. And I'm like, what? How does she do that? You know, because in my head, I had this picture of like old crusty white men do that stuff. And to see this young, confident, beautiful woman talking about she does this, that was my second moment where I was like, I'm sold. And then of course I watched Silence of the Lambs and I decided I need to be Clarice. Jodie Foster. Yeah, Jodie Foster. So, I love that. So that was it, you know? And, and again, you know, inmates... <laughs> uh, typically are from low socioeconomic status and they're forgotten and they typically have, you know, horrible backgrounds and things like that. And so, you know, I, I just thought this could be not only interesting, 
but it can be challenging and maybe I can actually make a difference in the world without sounding like a narcissist. You know, maybe I can do something here. That's like beautiful. Thank you. That's like a beautiful story. <laughs> Making me feel shallower and shallower. No, I'm, starting to, I'm starting to feel less than. You help you know, people all the time. Stop it. I felt better before. Now I'm like, what the hell's wrong with me? <laughs> that's so true. But I think that's amazing that, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's funny as you go through life, you meet all types of people. Yeah. It is a privilege to sit here with you today. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, that. there's something about you that that that's, you know, beyond your physical self. It's inside you. Thank you. I that, appreciate that. That speaks to you and says, you know, um, maybe I can make a difference. Maybe I can help somebody. Yeah. And, you know, correctional facilities are the new psych hospitals. You know, you, I'm, I'm sure you know there was deinstitutionalization in the 70s. They closed all the psych hospitals. And so where did all the mentally ill people go? 122 federal prisons. Yeah, That's what there, they, Those right. are the new mental hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, people want to ask where the where where did the mental health care go? They're all locked up. They locked them up. They locked them up. Yeah. The Republican Party at that time made a decision that I think it was Reagan. I think it was Reagan. Trickle down economics. It was saving some money. Well, we're just going to just put them in jail. Yeah, just put them in jail. We already have all these yeah. jails. We might as well just fill right. them up, right? And addicts. You know, not those go hand yes, in hand. Yes, and addicts. addicts and, that's a whole other thing, diagnosis, correct? You know, those are so, go, so close in hand, mental illness and yeah. Substance abuse. So yeah, I get yeah. it. Um, I was in prison, and and uh, we were. I was offered the RDAP program. Oh yeah, because I was uh, an admitted alcoholic and drug addict. Right. In, in, during my probationary interview and all that, and um, you know, I had a a, a woman that uh, was sort of like my psychologist in there. You know, my I forget what they call them now. Counselor therapist. She, she was a counselor, Sponsor. but yeah, there was <laughs> each one of us had assigned one. There were like. The class was like uh, 52 people and a 13 per caseload. That's and nice. And she would sit with me. Her name was Miss Hannah. Oh, Miss Hannah, I hope you're okay. Huh. And she was notorious. She was known for being like the toughest person on the whole compound. Good for her. But she was very good to me. And she took an interest in me. And she put forth all kinds of like thoughts in my head and ideas and uh trying to not just analyze, but, mm -hmm. but proselytize to, to say, this might happen when you get out. Your, Good for your, her. Your wife, your ex-wife might, you know, be this and your kids. And I want to say that I nodded my head and I, I pretended like, yeah, I get it, but I yeah. just want to get the hell out of there. Yeah. But I, I did what she said, a bunch of stuff, because I'm very much into self-help. Yeah. I, uh, I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. If I had a uh, drug problem, an alcohol problem, a life problem. Love AA. And yeah, and I went in uh, in 1990. And so I was in for a year, the program, and I uh, wasn't happy with my personal growth. Mm. So I sought out a, uh, psych a psychiatrist. His name was Dr. Arthur Kanawit. He was the father of the study of addiction at that time. It's a whole big story. But, um, you know, he changed my life. Yeah. I got so much so at seven years of therapy. Yeah. And oftentimes I was traveling. I was in London. I was in Scotland. I was in Ireland. I was in Germany. I was running around the world because I do international banking and trading and all that kind of stuff. But no matter where I was in the world, we had a phone appointment. Nice. If I couldn't get in. Nice. And I would say that changed my life. So a lot of people um, scoff at psychologists. Unfortunately, and, yeah. And psychiatrists. Yeah. And, you know, I did as a younger man. I did too. And then I realized that there were people, like if I buy an hour of your time, mm -hmm. I got you for an hour. Mm -hmm. Now I know a lot of people, they go in, I say, what, what, you know, you, you had to go see a psychologist because it's court ordered or something. Yeah. Like, I've, I've had to, I ran a lot of AA groups and all that, a sign for them. And they, I say, so what'd you talk about? She goes, oh, I just lied. I said, I don't get it. You know, you got this time with someone that's educated right. for an hour. I've got their ear. I got their eyes. Why would I lie to you? I, I mean, mean I, listen, I never understood this. I never understood it either. Ninety percent of my job is weeding through bullshit. Excuse my language, but now was that true? Yeah. You know, oh yeah. I mean, you know, you got to, you got a lot of. When you're locked up, you got a lot of what we call secondary gain, right? So say that again. Secondary. Secondary gain, which means you're trying to get something for something, right? So maybe inmates are maybe they're they have a sex offense. They're trying to hide from hide, get off the compound, hide in mental health. Maybe they have a drug debt on the yard. They want to hide in mental health. Maybe they just see a couple of female therapists. They want to come in there and just hang out with female therapists, talk to them. 
Uh, some of them are drug seeking. You know, if I pretend I'm psychotic or I tell this doctor Sabachin. I'm hearing voices, yeah, I it was get, a whole program get, where they're yeah. giving out Sabachin and all. Yeah, okay. so you know, you got a lot of guys trying to get one over on you because they have secondary gain now. But what I was, what I was going to say is that, you know, I, 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 mix, I get. I'm expected to be lied to. That's not a problem. I like to think I can see through it. At the end of the day, I I can't wave a magic wand, right? And it's the same concept in AA and NA, right? I can't get you to stop. No. I can give you the tools no. and I can support you and I can help you, but you got to make that decision on your own. So if you're going to lie to me for an hour, that's on you. I can try and call you on your crap and I can try and guide you, but just like 12-step programs, you know, you can't make anybody do anything. Right, and, and I've learned that even if I come in and I tell you the truth, and I'm begging you and reaching out to you, and I'm listening, that doesn't mean I'm going to get well either. That's true. But at That's least true. it's a step in the right direction. It is a step in the right direction. No, you got to I mean, try. Honesty, honesty is step one in the 12-step programs for a reason, right? right. Honest, it's the same thing in therapy, you know? And I, I've lied to my therapist. I think everybody's lied to their therapist at least Have once you? Well. Oh, yeah, for sure. Tell us, give Especially us an example. Especially when I was younger. I mean, I give used, me an example. Okay, when I was in my 20s, I was bartending in New York City, and I was doing all sorts of crazy stuff, which I won't go into detail, but... You know, I used to lie about where I would hang out or how much I'd be drinking, things of that nature. Yeah, I think everybody's lied to their therapist. But why? Why would you lie? I'm just curious. I was young. I was, you know, a little naive. I was ashamed. I think I was trying to... Uh, shame is a big sh one. Shame. I think shame, you know, I didn't want my, you know, I didn't want to be perceived a certain way. You know, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to become a doctor and so you can't know that I'm hungover. You know, stupid in things that you learn with life. You know, when you're younger, you don't, you don't... You don't get it. Yeah, you don't get it. Right. You don't get it. You don't yeah. think it through. So you know, it's funny. It's like it's like I was just thinking about an. I was trying to think in, of, in my mind of an example, and you know, a lot of times, I, I I'm a guy. I'm a guy's guy. I worked on Wall Street. All alpha males crammed in. Right. <laughs> and you get to know guys, and I owned firms and all that kind of stuff, and you become a little bit of a psychologist. You do for, for, for men. sure. And. Um, you know, this guy would tell me about this woman. They love this woman, and they think she's the, the, the you know, the bee's knee. She's the, she's the, uh, the answer to all his problems. Sure. And this and that. And he sees her every day. I said, "What, what do you think? I mean, uh, what, what does she say to you when you, you ask you out?" And he's like, oh no, no, I never asked her. <laughs> and I'm like, really? And and so to me, that's so crazy because like, I'm very direct, and I would want and but. And, and, and what do you got to lose, right? Where she can say is no. Uh, yeah, at least you get an answer. Yeah. yeah. At least, uh, you know, if not, why? So why wouldn't you go out with me, you know, yeah. God as friends, whatever. Right. So, you know, and, uh, but I realized at that moment when this guy was explaining this to me, I realized that there were different cats than me. They were all, we're all different cats. Right. It's what makes the, it what's, it's what makes life interesting. Right. They were all the same. It would probably suck. It would be boring. It would right. be stupid. Right. I knew everything you're going to do. I, you know, everything I'm going to do. It's crazy. Yeah. That's the excitement of yeah. life of, uh, you know, we like to say in the business, we say, that's what makes markets. Yeah. There are buyers right. and sellers. You just want to dump this shit and get out, and then I'm looking to buy it. Right. Right? right. So it's 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 two, two different competing interests and thoughts. Well, same with inmates. You know, I think people just assume all inmates, they just throw them together. You know, all criminals, all inmates, all felons. No, every single person in that's locked up is an individual. Is it, a is different it, human being. So each one is, I hate to say it, I used to say each one of us is a Greek tragedy. Yeah, a Greek tragedy and... and We're you all know, different. The, Entirely different. A 19-year-old kid locked up for selling weed is very different than a 45-year-old pedophile. Those are not... Yeah. That, those two have nothing in common. Yeah. The problem is the prison system in this country just lumps them all together. Correct. Right? It's really... So there's really, really no individualized uh, treatment. You know, I, I'm sort of an expert on that subject, having spent nine years and four months right. in federal custody. And, you know, when you're in transit... You know, you're definitely divided by security levels True. and threats and all these things. But when you're in the detention center, I, they put me in a room with a guy. He walks in one day right right before count, the 4 p.m. count. And uh, he walks in and he goes, I'm a bad motherfucker. I'm a bad motherfucker. I hurt people. He's looking at me, talking to me. He's a big, tall Latin guy, about 24 years old. And I say, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm Ross. I'm just, uh, I'm just a Wall Street guy, <laughs> and I don't know what to say to the guy. And um, I said, welcome. Nice to meet you. And he's like all threatening and all this and that. Right. And I'm like, uh, so what are you in for? He goes, I murdered two people. And I got the death sentence. Oh, he was on death row? 
Well, you know, he was he got oh, a death, death sentence, death. but he was getting, that's where he's going. Okay. And I was trying. Eventually, we became a little friendly. Yeah. I got him to pray with me and all kinds of stuff, and we tried to get him just down to life. Yeah. In prison, so he comes into my cell, uh, like at uh, three thirty on a four o'clock count. And we do the count, and then we go to get chow. He's mm -hmm. in the federal detention center. We go to a table, and I go back to the room, and he comes back in like 15 minutes later. So f I know the guy for totally one hour, and he comes back, and he goes, bro, look. And he has a nine-inch knife. Sounds about right. A real knife. I'm not talking about like a fake. Not a shank. It was a knife. It was a knife. Yeah. And not, where the fuck does this come from? I'm thinking. And he goes, bro, I, 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 you don't have to worry, he tells me. Oh, now, now, now he's got your back. And he sticks it under his under his bed, and I'm thinking, oh, they're gonna do a shakedown. They're gonna, I'm gonna get caught. I said, how did this guy get a knife? He's been in this for 40 minutes, so, you know, he's, <laughs> and half the hour was locked in the room. Well, maybe he needs to be in prison. <laughs> maybe a guy like that is right yeah, where he belongs. Yeah, well, he, he killed two people yeah. in broad daylight for a Rolex um, and cold blood on a camera in a yeah. jewelry store. Yeah, and I, uh, but I ended up trying to help the guy, and uh, and he would smoke the K2 every day, and he would get everybody to advance some drugs. And then when they would ask for the money and put pressure on him, he would just stab them. This was in the building at Federal Detention Center of Miami. And, and he was, I found out later he was spent, of the four years he was in, he spent about three years in the show in, in special housing detention. Yeah, probably a psychopath. And he had stabbed like three or four people in the building and he had fought with every cop in the building. And they kept threatening that they're gonna you know, keep him in the shoe and this and that, but or solitary and they don't do it. They keep him in for a minute, you know, yeah. months. And I had a few situations like that. I had a couple of guys that were lifers, and yeah. and, and 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 I was like, "What the fuck?" I, mean, I felt I felt like they was they did this on purpose to me. But you know, the truth is, they mix security levels they do. when you're in detention right. and when when you're in transit, and it's really nuts. But yeah. the system is a disgrace. But on then your I, statement. But then I see somebody like you, and you know, you and I get, got a chance to chat for about a half an hour. Sure before we got on, on, on the set here. And uh, I'm very impressed with you. Thank you. And now we understand that you have an innate goodness in you <laughs> that got you into this whole thing, but you'll have a whole lot of life experience. So while you have this innate goodness, you attempt, you, it's, it's tampered with a little, or jaded by a little reality, right? Sure, sure. But you mean well, right? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think the system, the criminal justice system in America needs a drastic overhaul. You know, and and it and I know you did federal. I worked in state prisons. The amount of difference in how they treat inmates, you know, in certain states is it's really like California prisons versus New York prisons versus Florida prisons. I can honestly say. And I'll, can you explain I, it to, to yeah, the audience? Yeah, sure. So, for example, so I, I, in California prisons, those are state run. Uh, you know, every prison has problems, and there's corruption in every prison. But those are state run, so there's no profit motive really. So let's say, for example, the federal government requires that inmates get a certain amount of protein, certain amount of veggies, certain amount of carbs, right, right, right. right? Let's say it costs, I don't know, 10 cents an inmate meal, right? right? So in California or New York, you might get some chicken, some uh, rice, some broccoli, for 10 cents a meal. Now in Florida, let's say you substitute the chicken with spam, you know, that crappy fake meat. I like spam. Uh, yeah, uh, well, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about. Or you substitute the right, rice with uh, box mashed potatoes and right. it costs six cents a meal, right? You right. should know this better than me. You're a finance guy. Yep. So where does that four cent different go? Well, it goes in someone's pocket, right? So you're still hitting the federal guidelines by giving them their protein, whatever. Correct. But you're cutting costs, right? Now you apply that same model to mental health and medical. That's what you get in Florida prison systems, right? So I'll give, for example, in, in the... California prison system I worked at, there were 24 psychologists, 20 psychiatrists. 24 psychologists in one prison? For 1,500 inmates, right? There were 20, yeah, that's what I'm saying. What? 24, 24 psychiatrists, 24 social workers, and 24 music and art therapists. In Florida, for the same amount of inmates, there are two. We had three for 1,100 Okay, inmates. so you get, it, you get it. You see the difference? So wow. in, in California, I was able to do actual therapy, actual treatment, actual I'm evaluations. Right yeah. In Florida, treatment goes like this. Are you suicidal? Are you homicidal? No. Next. Are you suicidal? Are you homicidal? No. Next. Are you suicidal? You know, it's, That's it's the like, federal system. Yeah. Like that, right. Just so they just don't they just want to make sure you don't die in their watch. Don't kill anybody on my watch. Right. Right. No liability. That's it. There's no actual. And, you know, they're cutting GED programs. They're cutting uh, all trades. That. All of that. So, you know. 
and I, I work a lot with juvenile populations. You go in at 18, 19, you get out, you have no GED. You have no, I mean, you have no GED, no work skills, no support system. You have a substance abuse habit. You know, you're getting out. Of course you're going back in. I'm not, I'm not making, and I'm big on personal accountability. People are responsible for their own choices. But what have you set up for this kid? Yeah, what do you think he's going to do? What do you think he's going to do? What do you think he's going to do? You know, he's going to go, uh, go work at Home Depot right. and uh, make $11? Right. We good? I just Mike, the technical crew got all, all up, up in arms for a second. So yeah, it's a broken system and I see it all the time and I, I worked in it for a very long time, but it felt like I was pushing a boulder uphill. You know, you got bureaucracy, you got lack of resources, you got lack of support. And so it gets really draining. And in my 20s and 30s, when I was excited and green and I'm going to help every inmate right, and right. I'm going to save the world, you have that energy. But then when you get older, you get, you, you get burnt out and you're like, Man, I keep seeing the same faces. The recidivism rate is crazy. And these people, crazy. nobody cares. And nobody cares. And so I, I, that's why I left and I decided to open my own forensic practice in 2021. I've been doing that. So I help in a different way now. What is a forensic practice? So a forensic psychologist is basically a regular clinical psychologist who's applying clinical knowledge to answer a legal question. So I work, I still work with inmates. I still work in jails and prisons. Um, but I'm doing evaluations mostly for the court. So for example, is this inmate not guilty by reason of insanity? Is this inmate competent to stand trial? What are the odds that this sex offender is going to commit another sex offense? So a lot of um, psychological testing, is risk he evaluation. Fit for release? Is, is he, he fit for release? Uh, what, are, what are the odds that he's going to be violent again? Did he do his treatment? Um, so I do a lot of testifying, um, a lot of mitigation evaluations, juveniles. So I love those because, for example, you'll see a kid acting up. And they'll throw him in jail. And then I go and evaluate him, and I realize his mother's on crack. His father's in prison. He's been abused in the foster care right. system. Nobody cares. Where, you know, he's from the hood, and he's just trying to make some money selling weed. So when I get to testify and explain to a judge, hey, look, this kid isn't a budding psychopath. He's not a bad kid. He has a shit circumstances. Right. He was, you know, given these horrible cards. And, and he's got trauma and he's got uh, depression and he's got, you know, and the judge actually listens to me and gives the kid some treatment instead of throwing him in juvenile. That feels good. I love that. This. feels good. I love that. That's that was why just I do a, it. That was an amazing, uh, that was just an amazing narration. I mean, I got to say that Walter, I hope you're watching this because if you could give, uh, bring her in, Dr. Haji. He owns Prisonology, and he's a writer for Forbes. Oh, love that. He does a lot of mitigation for inmates. Oh, I do mitigation stuff all the and, time. And try to help them and get yeah. some better sentences and get them early releases and yeah, all call these me. good different things. Dr. Haji, <laughs> give yeah. you the friends and family discount. <laughs> yeah, so I get to work in a different way, and I don't have to be in the prison 40 hours a week. I mean, you know, it, it's tough. You know, windows, and I mean, I got to go home. You didn't, but no windows, and and no, no, you know, you don't have any freedom. You don't have your phone, and you know, right. you're dealing with correction officers, which sometimes are inmates with badges. Literally, no, just, no, no disrespect to the good COs out there. You guys right. have been good to me and helped save my life. But let's be honest, some of them are inmates with badges. A lot of corruption. It's draining. So I, I can't even imagine. I used to say I'm here because I'm forced to be here. But what the hell are you doing here? Yeah, you know, I've yeah. actually said that to a few COs and to a few uh, yeah. people. And you know, well, a lot of them are there for the wrong reasons. We know this. They're for the wrong reasons. Yeah. And uh, like not the, all. No, no, but some of them. And they would say to me, you know, if I didn't have this uniform, I'd be an inmate. I, and I believe that. And they admit that. I and, and the I guys just, that admit I respect it, the you, honesty. You, yeah, the guys <laughs> that admit it, you know, they're telling you the truth. Yeah, right. And uh, I'll tell you something very interesting. So I had a doctor when I first went into FCI Miami. Yeah. I went in September 10, 2014, literally 10 years ago. And, um, she was a wonderful Cuban lady. Mm -hmm. And she would try and like go through her motions with me, this me, but I'm an older guy. I'm a little bit more pushy. I'm a little more clever, you know. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit more experience dealing with people. And I wouldn't let her do that. I would I would sort of, as much as I could, you know, push her, push the envelope, break her horns. And I got her to talk a little bit. And she said, you know what, Mr. Mandel, she goes, when I came into this prison. Yeah. I had the, the the idea that I was going to revamp this, and I was going to revamp that, and I was going to I was going to make this better. I yeah. was going to take care of the inmates, this, that, and other thing. And you know what? The clinical director, the system, the ward, they said, "What are you doing?" Yeah, 
literally, yeah. the people that worked there said, you're making me look bad. Stop it. Yeah, uh, 100%. I mean, I can tell I can tell you horror stories of, uh, you know, I worked in a prison which shall remain nameless where they were, the COs were beating on the mentally ill inmates. And I'm not going to stand for that. You know, I was taught injustice is injustice. You stand up for it no matter what. I went to the warden and I said, hey, hey, your CO is back there in mental health. They're beating on the, the mentally ill guy. And yes, you have your psychopathic, super violent guys right. that, that require use of force. That's different. This was like they were beating on him for a enjoyment. Right, yeah, yeah. It. And the warden basically looked at me and said, do you want your job, yes or no? And I thought, oh, the corruption goes all the way to the top. All, all the way to the top. The wardens he, are the most the, corrupt. Yeah. He that's how they become wardens, and that's how they became wardens. Right, exactly. And so, you know, and that was a real rude, that was about 15 years ago, it was a real rude wake-up call for me, but I was like, wow, you know, I'm trying to be a whistleblower here because these guys are getting beat on in mental health. They're genuinely sick. And the warden is just kind of like, yeah, you can either work here or not work here, but you're going to shut up. You know, I recently found out, I'm not going to say how I found out on camera, that I was, a, there was a whistleblower at FDC Miami. Yeah. And uh, she blew the whistle and filed a lawsuit with the federal government about the behavior of people in the federal detention center of Miami. It was like hell. And uh, it was pointed out to me hmm. by a journalist. My name was uh, blacked out in the yeah. document I was sent hmm. by fax. I was the first case of 40 names on this wow. document. The whistleblower was saying we were wrongfully detained when the, the detention center was advised that I was available. I should have been released. And I was approved already at different levels. They decided to keep me anyway. Yeah, this For doesn't whatever reason, me. I don't even know. The corruption is crazy. What the, the hell did they need Ross Mandel in their prison? But they kept me an extra almost a year and a half. And then finally when the the... the the uh, lid came off the secret. Mm -hmm. Instead of releasing me, they shipped me off to Coleman Camp. When I get there, the administrator, I'm sitting there, with, she called me in, and she types up my name, and she goes, Mando, what the hell are you doing here? Your release papers are filled out and already in my computer. I said, you're asking me? They yeah, woke right. me up at one in the morning. <laughs> right. They told me to pack my shit. Yeah. They put me in handcuffs yep. and leg chains. Yep. And put me on a bus. Yep, that's it. What am I doing here? Right. You know, they sent yeah. me here. You know, uh, right. I'm right. property. I'm chattel. And and you know, some people have this this I, this notion or this idea. You know, well, you know, you can don't complain about the prison. So you shouldn't have committed a crime. Okay, yes, fair. Like I said, I'm all about personal accountability. But you know, that doesn't mean that your human rights cease to exist once right. you get locked up. You're already paying paying punishment. You know, you're already paying your doing your time. It doesn't mean you're less than human, and and I'm not I'm not saying we need to you know put Starbucks in prison, and 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 I'm not saying that. I understand there's a punitive component, but what people don't understand is most inmates are going to be released back to the community. Most Correct. inmates are not lifers, so they're Correct. coming out, right? Right. So if we don't help them, whether what you're you, Republican, Democrat, what are you creating? Penalty, yeah, what are you creating? Whether you're you know on this side of the political spectrum, this side of the political, either way, we should be agree that if you're not helping them get better. It doesn't serve anybody. Well, let me just suggest this to you because this is something that I learned pretty quickly, but that's only because I have a very trained eye in this regard. I spent a lifetime identifying opportunities, hmm. opportun uh, financial opportunities, business opportunities, et cetera. And when I looked at the system, and it took me about five minutes, I realized this is an economy. Oh, yeah. This prison, let's talk to feds. They have 122 federal prisons that include maximum all the way to camps. Right. It doesn't include halfway houses, probationers, right. parolees, all that shit. You're talking about 122 prisons. Right now, about 180,000, 185,000 inmates, right. down from almost 300,000, which is pre-COVID. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, you're talking about an $8 billion budget. There it is. Budget. It's a business. There it is. Now, if you and I went into business. Yeah. I would say to you, you know, we got these customers. How do we keep them? We make, right. No, 100%. We keep them coming back by uh, what not do we helping say, them get better. What do we say, Lena? We want them to recidivate. How do we keep these customers? We keep them sick and criminal. Correct. Yeah. And so you don't sick, have to be a genius. addicted and criminal. Yeah, 100%. You don't have to be a genius. Now, to prevent public outcry, what do you do? 
You pretend. I got an idea. <laughs> you pretend. Let's hire two dozen psychologists. Right. And this way, you know, the optics. The optics work, yeah. A little yeah, we bit have better. mental health in prison. No, we don't. And if we can help, if they help a few people, all right. Right. But you know what? Right. Overall, we got a pretty good yeah. business plan, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the privatized prisons is even worse. I mean, how are you making a profit off of human suffering? It shouldn't be legal. Privatized prisons should not be legal. I don't know how it's legal, but. Well, because, you know, once you realize that it, once you're in government and you realize that it's a business, you say, you know what? We can't run a business. Let's privatize it. Yeah. They'll make it a better business. Yeah. So now the CEOs are getting $10 an hour. Right. And I'll give you a great example. Right. So um, I get sick in prison. Yeah. My blood pressure is like 180 over 130. Because I first I go to, uh, I have chest pain. So uh, I can't go to the drug program, RDAP, right. two, three days in a row. The third day, this lovely woman I told you about, this psychologist, comes up to me. She goes, Manda, what's going on? I said, I'm so sick. I'm laying in bed. I'm soaking wet. No, there's very little help. I mean, I, I, was, I had a, a lot of people that cared about me in prison. A lot of the inmates were very good because I was teaching them. Right. I taught classes. And another misconception. Not all inmates are horrible humans. Wonderful guys <laughs> yeah. that helped me with because I couldn't function. I couldn't right. even, I couldn't stand up to walk to the bathroom. That's right. how bad it was. I was so sick. This is right before COVID and um before they knew it was a virus. Yeah. Like the first week of January of uh twenty twenty. Of two twenty twenty twenty. And so, you know, I'm so sick and she says, Well, you know what you have to do. So I have somebody go into the office and say, I'm having chest pains. Yeah, that's what you got. You got to manipulate the Either system. Either that or you got to fall down in the child hall in front of, in front of 200 system. people. I get it. So they bring, they wheel me. They say, you got to go to, uh, to the infirmary. I really couldn't walk. So they bring a wheelchair. Right. So we get in. The doctor says, all right, man, that would, like I'm acting. I got like 105 fever. Uh, my blood pressure is in stroke territory. And as soon as my, she got the blood pressure, she goes, you're not sick. And I'm sitting there. And then all of a sudden, they, they did the vitals. And she heard 180 over 130. She goes, call 911. So they run a call 911. Ambulance comes to the camp, federal prison camp, Miami. And the warden comes out and says to the, there's two, two COs that have to go with me yeah. in the ambulance. Transport. I'm in, a, I'm in a minimum security camp. Right. I'm a camper. Right. I have a financial crime, never hurt anybody, never right. touched anybody, all these different things. And he says, the last thing I, I remember as they were closing, make sure you don't admit him. I don't want him admitted. It's not not, it's not save my life, not take it. Make sure they don't admit me to the hospital. Why? Because it fucks up his budget. Yeah, of course. There goes like 20 grand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. So as, now, as if he has any medical knowledge. Right. They bring me into the emergency room. And this wonderful doctor says, Mr. Mandel, she's doing all my vitals. She's going through everything. They put an IV right away for pain. Made me feel better immediately. A few different things. And she goes... They, they they say to me, I'm not allowed to admit you, but I'm the doctor. Yeah, that's right. So fuck them. That's right. And she admitted me. I Good stayed there for two nights. It was my Good best two her. nights in prison. I bet. I had my own room. I was in the cardiac care, CCU, the cardiac care unit. Oh, you were sick, sick. Yeah, I was really sick. And um, Good for her. And, and she said, I'm worried about you. So now the two officers are there, and uh, they go into the hallway, and there's a little... Once they find that I'm admitted, that was a whole, they all got in trouble. It wasn't really crazy. And uh, there's, there's, I have my own room. I'm in a bed. I got a remote control. I'm watching TV. I can order up food, which I'm doing every hour, but it's a CCU. <laughs> right. But I was just ordering, I couldn't even, I was so sick, but I was just ordering food just to break their balls. Sure. Because I wanted to see what it was like. I forgot what it was like to have that kind of service. And, uh, There's, there's like a fight going on right outside my room. And I hear these guys screaming. Meanwhile, I'm cuffed to the bed. Like I'm fucking going to run yeah. away. I can't even yeah. walk. Yeah. They cuffed me to the bed. That's how they my, roll. My legs are cuffed to the bed. Always. And uh, to, to go to the bathroom, I have to have someone uncuffed the fucking thing. So I, get, they go, I go, you know, shuffle to the little bathroom there. And it turns out these two guys come in and they said, well, that was crazy. I said, what, what was that? They said that, they were from a new temp agency. They're former officers, but they're coming in, they get $10 or $12 an hour versus the cops that came from the prison were getting $50 an hour. Oh, wow. And it was easy duty. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you yeah. get double, double pay yeah. 
and you just sit there yeah. watching TV with me for eight hours a day, yeah. making sure I'm not going to escape. Fair. So that that's some of the corruption that you sure. see in some of the, the, the craziness. And that's the least of it. Now, to our audience, I have to ask this question because if I don't, I'm going to take a lot of hits. You're a very attractive woman. Thank you. When you went into prison, did you get... I mean, firstly, the the cops that worked there. The COs are probably worked in the COs inmates, yeah. hitting on you. Yeah. The inmates talking to you. I give give us an idea. Well, I remember when Jody Foster went in to see yeah, Hannibal yeah, Lecter. Yeah, there was some yeah, crazy shit it, going yeah, on yeah. there. I mean, here's the thing. First of all, I, I I don't go to prison looking like this. I mean, I have minimal makeup, hair up, no jewelry. I wear scrubs. I dress down. Um, and, uh, you know, no the, nonsense, no, no, nonsense. no nonsense, no nonsense, uh, baggy clothes. You know, you have some females who work in prison who are looking for attention because they're just unwell and insecure. You don't want that kind of attention. Right. Um, at the end of the day, you know, if you treat inmates with respect, they're going to treat you with respect. Now you have your five, 10 percent who are total assholes. They'll pull out their penis. They'll they'll talk crap what? to you. Oh, yeah. I've seen more penises in prison than anywhere else. Eli, um, you know, you have your couple assholes, but. What, you guys? We're playing. That's a thing. Yeah. It That's happens. Thing. That's a thing. They call them gunners. It happens. What they do they call, call it? Gun in Florida, they call them gunners. They pull out their dick and they just do what they want to do. And uh, There's actually it. a name for that? Yeah, gunning. Boy, I'm naive, gunning. huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but probably because you didn't engage in that behavior, thankfully. Right. I barely do that in my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, gunning. I'm going home. You got guys that do that. Maybe I'm gunning tonight. Oh my god! Um, <laughs> but you know, a lot of it's I never heard that gunning. Yeah. Have any of you heard that out there? You never heard of gunning. You heard of gunning. Gunning. Okay, never you. heard of that. Yeah, it's a Florida. Well, he's term. a gunner. He's, he's a gunner. Yeah, he's you're a, a gunner. He's a gunner. He's a um, sharpshooter. So you know, but being a female has its advantages and its disadvantages. A lot of times they view you as. You know, a mother, a wife, a sister, right. uh, you're somebody, I'm, and I'm not a CO, I'm a psychologist, I'm there to help them, you know. But they call you CO, don't they? They think no, you're no. a CO, no? No, no, uh, I'm not in uniform, they know them, I'm Dr. Haji. Okay. They know I'm Dr. Haji. So, you know, the couple times that I've been in actual real danger in prison, uh, one time was a riot and another time an inmate uh, tried to attack me, the first people that came to my defense were not correction officers. Inmates. It was the other, it was yeah. other inmates. Just the people being people. Yeah, guys they were like, you're guys. not going to fuck with Dr. Haji. That, that's not going to happen. You know what I mean? So the couple times that I was in real danger, COs got there 10 minutes later. Are you okay? And it's like, right. yeah, I'm okay because the, all the inmates had my back. Wow. Yeah. So you treat people just like anywhere else. You treat people with, with respect. 90% of them are going to treat you with respect. You know what I mean? And 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 you you I, I make sure I'm fair. I make sure I'm consistent. I make sure I treat people the same. Um, and I tell them, you know, I'm here as a psychologist. I'm, I'm here to help you if you want the help. But I expect you to respect me just the way I'm going to respect you. End of story. And and that way, you know, yeah, you got your couple assholes that make dumb comments and engage in gunning. But other than that, gunning, not really. I feel like I feel yeah. like I, I'm, I'm nine years in the system and I never heard that before. It's a good thing. Well, it's probably, but you know, I love to understand these things. I'm going to be using this expression now. Gunning, yeah, it's uh, very listen, Florida. Have any of you gone gunning? You know, I mean, I mean, it's now. You mentioned earlier that you uh, you spent a, a minute in Sing Sing. I did. Couple uh, years, Austin, in New York. Yes, all the way up there. All the way up there. Before wow. I moved to Florida, uh, I loved it. I worked there as at the master's level. Sing Sing was actually a great prison. They had a lot of programming. They have a documentary out right now about how they uh, provided master's degrees education to about thirteen inmates. Not what? one of those guys recidivated. Not one. Wow. Which just goes to show you, you provide, you know, and they had to be nonviolent, non sex offenders. Correct. Correct. They had to be good standing, but they good candidates. Yeah, good candidates, but. Not one of them, and this was years ago, 15, 20 years ago, not one of them to this day has recidivated. Um, wow. Who went through, who got their master's What degree. does that tell you, everybody? A lot. People need help. Yeah, education. You send these people in, you bet, it, you know, I love they call it the Federal Correctional oh, Institution. Well, there's no correctional. correctional and rehabilitation. But there's none. I was in nine years, there was zero. No, they call zero. it corrections and now, rehabilitation. Now, luckily, I'm an older guy, and I am, I'm, 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 Financially stable and yeah, but had you not been, uh, what you would you be do? Back. If I was a drug dealer, I'd yeah. come out. You know what I do? You I'd end up doing right drugs. I, and yeah, I, I agree. If I was a I, fraudster, I'd end up doing fraud. Agreed. Because you know, if you, yeah, you don't know what am I going to do? Well, not not eat. You're going to be homeless and not eat. Right. God forbid, I had a right. family and I can't provide. Right. And again, everybody has choices to make. But when you're setting people up for failure, what do you expect? Good client. Right. That's right. Good if you're client. Running, if you're we're going to make a ton of money. Yeah. That's a good client. Hundred percent. And um, 
which is really frightening. And it's sad. Like, it's frightening. It's and it's sad. I mean, these are human beings. And it gives you, but it gives you a a more clear understanding of this sort of world we live in. I hate to say it. Yeah, know? and it's generational. You know, I work with juveniles, and I where's your dad? He's locked up. Okay. Where's I was. You, where's your dad? He's I was a stockbroker, and I was a meaningful stockbroker. I was very successful, and I was successful because I was able to reward reward people that dealt with me. I was like in demand, mm -hmm. right? So I, I did a lot of business from a lot of very well-to-do guys. And one of the things I learned quickly was I had a number of doctors, medical doctors. They're, they're typically bright people, learned people, but while they're busy studying human anatomy, mm -hmm. I'm learning how to make money. Yeah, they didn't teach us that. Right. So, <laughs> Which is why so, I need your help. <laughs> correct. So I, it wasn't lost on me. I would call a, a surgeon and they'd say, Mr. Mandel, hold on, hold on one second. And next thing you know, the doc would come on the phone. I say, you know, doctor, did I catch you at a bad time? And he says, no, no, no. I said, well, I'm doing a surgery right now. I said, what kind of surgery? A kidney transplant. I said, there's a guy on the table right now? He goes, yeah, 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 but don't worry. Why are you on the phone? He goes, this is more important. Oh, okay. And I heard that from That's concerning. 15, 20 doctors over the course of my career. That's concerning. They left the OR because they were afraid that they would miss a hot Ross Mandel tip. I'm not being honest. I, I believe and you. And I learned it's, it's that, concerning, that okay. I used to think health comes first, yeah. then money, and then love. And I learned a very brutal lesson because I'm an idealist at heart. I'm yeah. a romantic guy and all these different things. And I learned, no, no, no. To the rest of the world, or to a good, the great part of the world, money comes first. Yeah, not for me. I know that because we decided, we, we've already learned, we've uncovered that you have an innate goodness in you. You know how much money I could have made if I had decided to do the wrong thing in prison? Man, Man. one Newport is going for $20 because they Correct. cut it up in four pieces. You know how easy it would be to get a Newport she knows, in prison? She knows. Come on, cell phones, child porn, whatever you want, it's Whatever you want. And, and I mean, you got to draw lying, the line you know? of child porn. I mean, that's... Uh, oh, we all got to draw the line right, of child that's porn. Really but like, crazy. you know, a I, cigarette, I, I I, I, child porn is an absolutely so not... So COs that I knew were bringing in cigarettes. Oh, yeah. And, they, and some of them were bringing in cell phones. Oh, yeah. And some of them, you know, but when guys were asking for like a brick of coke, or this, they said, you know what? No, I draw the line there. No, you so, can get fentanyl. You can get K2. You, you can get... This is what people... So I'll give you an example. I was evaluating a guy the other day. The, the judge called me at Kirstein Courthouse. He calls me and he says, you know, we need an emergency evaluation. This guy's, something's wrong with him. I get there. I take two, one look at the guy. And the thing I like about me without sounding like an egomaniac is I have book smarts and I have street smarts, right? I look at the guy. I go, what'd you smoke? He goes, how'd you know, doc? What'd you smoke? <laughs> I smoked some K2 this morning. All right. So I go to his, I go to the judge. I go to the attorneys. I say, he's not having a psychotic break. He's not schizophrenic. He's high. Put him in the drunk tank. He'll be fine by tomorrow. His attorney, a private attorney, a well-to-do, well-dressed, right, right, right. how can he be high? He's been in jail six years. And I thought, are you an idiot? He's an idiot. Yeah, you, you're, a law, you're a criminal lawyer and you don't know that there are more drugs in prison and jail than there are in the hood? Are you kidding me? I'm sad to say are you that I actually me? know criminal lawyers that bring shit into prison. hundred percent. I actually know some. hundred percent. It's sad as fuck. Yes. Yeah. Everybody can, everybody has a price. Everybody can be bought. Everybody, you know, it's a sad world we live in, but you know. What's course. your price, Doc? I don't have a price. There is not enough money for me to smuggle drugs into prison. What would That's it take? horrible. Would it take no. a nice house? No. No. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm playing. <laughs> I'm playing. I've had many opportunities <laughs> and I've turned them down. I've worked too hard to get to where I am. I can't even imagine. Yeah, to I compromise that integrity. No way. You're a good person. Plus, you this. think about what you're doing to these guys. Oh, you know, you're bringing well, them fentanyl, heroin, K2, crack, cocaine. They're locked up. What do you? These guys die. They overdose it's all the, the time. Craziest thing. I uh, I just got a call this week. A guy I know. He was a sober guy. Mm. I met him through the Wall Street business, the trading business. But he was sober like 27 years. He lived in a friggin' 15 million dollar home, for real. And um, was a very loved guy. People loved him when, when he was using, prior to getting clean. Yeah. And while he was clean, he was a big, popular, loving, you know, guy. Apparently, he went out, meaning he relapsed. He right. picked, and his drug of choice, unfortunately, was heroin. Damn. And um, he got what they call a hot dose. Yeah. Was heroin laced with this fentanyl. Fentanyl. He died. And it killed him. 
Yeah, it's, you, you see that all the time. And he was a multimillionaire living in a multimillion and dollar home. he had 27 home. years sober, that's sad. He was sober for 27 years. Nobody knows exactly when, how uh, long he, he was he using. He relapsed, yeah, yeah. But um, sad. He, he, this fentanyl was killing Fent people. Fentanyl's no joke. It's a thousand times, it's a thousand, they say it's a thousand times as, as potent as heroin. Right, I mean, and there's a, new, there's a new scam going on for all you women out there. I was stunned by this, but women have to really tell. be careful. They're targeting women. In, they're going to malls mm -hmm. where women shop, men shop. But there's a lot of women, a lot of families that go to malls. Uh, it's, this is targeted for, for good-looking women. And they put a, a piece of paper mm. under your uh, windshield wiper. Oh, I saw that, yeah. The and sex trafficking you're talking and about. And it's laced with fentanyl. Just It's covered with fentanyl. The actual, there's a paper. You think it's a ticket or you think it's a fly. Yeah, you just so want to get it off it. your car. Yeah. And you, you touch it with your hands. And the fentanyl is absorbed transdermally through your skin and within seconds renders you unconscious. Sex trafficking. And they're pulling up in a van. Yeah. They're throwing the woman. Yeah. Putting, putting chains on her. Yeah, especially so, in South Florida. Right. That's just happening right now yeah. in Florida. Yeah. And throwing him in the back of the van. Yeah. And um, now you're chained up and you are a prisoner. I feel like I would be so annoying kidnappers would let me go after about half an hour. Well, you're very attractive. You would... Might have a problem. I'm just sharing this with you, but when I heard this, I was totally shocked that something like this could go on in, in the world today. And in Florida, at the town center mall, or these strip malls. Yeah. Um, Dr. Haji, where are you today? What's happening in your life today? Uh, well, let's see. I, um, I'm still run, you know, running my own practice, doing forensic psycho psychology work. What's the name of your practice? It's called RISE Psychological Services, R-I-S-E. Um, I'm on a TV show that just came out on Amazon Prime. What show? <laughs> what show? It's called World's Most Evil Prisoners. Oh boy! Uh, it's okay. trending on Amazon. Prime. I can't even imagine. You know, I'm, I'm you going. You gotta watch I'm, it. I'm going on a true crime podcast yeah, soon. It's it, like, oh yeah, yeah. It's the hottest topic. Everybody wants to know. Everybody. What I've lived and what you've. Yeah. Uh, I hate yeah. to say you've experienced. So check that out on Amazon Prime. I think I'm on five or six episodes. What's it called? World's World's Most Evil Prisoners. It's on Amazon Prime. It's trending. World's Most Evil Prisoners. Yeah, now I'm gonna have to watch. You that. have to watch that. Amazon yeah, Prime. I'll, I'll text it to you. Wow. Yeah. And um, that's it. Just living my life. Uh, you know. You're available for hire. I am available for a hire. I typically do not uh, talk to clients directly. I talk to attorneys. Attorney, criminal defense prudent. attorneys. Criminal defense attorneys at risepsychological.com. And uh, you do federal, state cases, whatever it is, federal, right? Federal, state, civil, and criminal. C civil, divorce I do, stuff. I, I, no, uh, PT, uh, emotional distress stuff. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. And uh, were you located in Miami? I am located in Miami. Okay. But I, I do work all over the state. I just came back from Tampa. E even the country, you're willing to travel. I am willing. If the price is right, right? <laughs> the price is right, right. You know, yeah. I get it. Yeah. That's really a beautiful thing. Dr. Lena Haji, everybody, what a privilege it was to have you, you today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful that you decided to come. Thank you. Welcome. We're going public with Dr. Haji, everybody. What an amazing hour we just spent. Mm -hmm.